sisters and, and friends, we are coming out to have a look at two ecclesias, Smyrna and Pergamos, and they're quite different. The Lord Jesus Christ begins his message to Smyrna by reminding them that he had been dead but was now alive. Now these words are drawn from Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. So when you go back to chapter 1 and you have a look at this vision of the multitudinous Christ, then you can see this uh, sort of imagery that's presented there. This represents Christ and the saints in glory in the kingdom age. Okay, so he's drawing from the imagery uh, of the multitudinous Christ vision. And he says, and I'm going to read to you verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell, that's the grave, and of death. Now, why does he open his letter to Smyrna that way? Well, because this ecclesia was the persecuted ecclesia. This ecclesia had lost members who had been slain by the, the local authorities and by the opposition that they had. So they were in trouble. They were being uh, pursued and, of course, it was going to get worse. <coughs> Christ in the it's going to get worse, he tells them, uh, in this letter. But the one thing about this ecclesia is that there is absolutely no criticism. There's only two of the seven ecclesias that don't have any criticism made of them. And Smyrna is one of them. The other one is Philadelphia. All the others, Christ criticises for one thing or another. So we want to have a look at this persecuted ecclesia here at Smyrna. <coughs> and we'll see the reason why he's drawn uh, on that matter of I am alive uh, after he had been crucified. So what was Smyrna? What was the the city of Smyrna. Well, it was one of the eyes of Asia, you remember. Today it's the city of Izmir, and you're going to see some photographs of Izmir in a moment. Uh, and we were there just a few weeks ago. In 600 BC, it was a strong city, but was weakened by Cyrus, who invaded this area. And it effectively lay dead for 400 years until rebuilt by the Greeks. It always had been a faithful ally of Rome and its people. Today called Izmir, a large city, now the third largest city in Turkey actually, predominantly Muslim in character. Now the name Smyrna is derived from Mer, you know, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, bitter. Mara, the place that Israel came to, bitter, same idea of Mary. So here you've got Smyrna meaning Mer, and of course Mer was used in the sacrifice of Christ, in the... In the embalming of Christ when, when the, the spices were taken. So we've got the idea of bitterness coming out of the name itself, Smyrna. And this ecclesia knew the bitterness of active persecution against them. It was not a really large city in AD 96, nor did it match Ephesus for commercial or cultural significance in Asia. Uh, it was sort of second to Ephesus, you might say, but it was one of the eyes of Asia. It was 75 kilometres in uh, Canadian terms, or 47 miles in American, north of Ephesus. It stood in a beautiful setting at the end of a long um, of the sea. And you're going to see uh, a picture of that at a moment. It was known as the ornament, the flower and crown of Asia. Now the reason it was called the crown of Asia was from the ring of high and noble buildings that were set on the hill that runs around in an arc at the east of the city, east and north of the city. It's called the Pagos. Uh, and you're going to see photos taken from the Pagos like this one. So this is modern Smyrna. We're actually standing up on the, on the hill that surrounds the city and looking down over the harbour. This is a long arm of the sea and this is quite a, a, a good harbour. Now you see this circle here. Well that circle encircles the only remaining ancient ruins of the city of Smyrna. And we had a bit of difficulty finding them actually. Uh, even though we had this photo to work from and a map, we still had difficulty finding it. It's about probably four acres or so of ruins. And they've done a fair bit of work there in recent times to uncover uh, what remains of the city. And when you get a bit closer, that's what it looks like. 
Uh, and uh, when you get, a, in fact, a little bit closer than that, you come down, this, this building here, by the way, is a car park, which is why it doesn't have any windows in it. Um, but it this, this is the area that they're excavating at, at present. You can't actually go in there. They're, they're doing a lot of work excavating uh, what remains of ancient Smyrna. So there it is. Well, what about the letter that Christ writes? As I said, it is a letter that doesn't have any criticism in it. He says in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation, so there's that word pressure again, and he says your poverty, so clearly these brethren and sisters had been affected by persecution. It was not easy for them to get employment because they were Christadelphians. It was not easy for them to survive because they were constantly being hounded and hunted. Now, that's not the case for most of us, of course. We don't really have a bad time in that regard. But there are some people in our community in different countries uh, who do have problems because they are Christadelphians. And they have to live in poverty because there's not much option for them. You know, Christ goes on to say, it's in brackets here, but thou art rich. So these brethren here in Smyrna didn't have a lot in terms of the world's goods. But they had a wealth that the world knew nothing about. They were very, very rich in the things of the truth and the hope that it gave them. The hope of eternal life, even though they might end up being persecuted to death. And he goes on to say this, And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now the synagogue of Satan here is clearly a group who had once belonged to the ecclesia, who claimed to be uh, of the hope of Israel, claimed to be Jews, so to speak, but had actually separated themselves from the ecclesia. As John said, some had, 1 John 2.19, he said, they departed from us. It, it appears as though there had been some kind of division here in Smyrna, because the core group of the ecclesia had stood for what was right, and these people had departed. They made life very difficult for them. He goes on to say this, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil, meaning of course the authorities, shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, what does Smyrna teach us? Well, it teaches us a very simple lesson. We should expect troubles and problems. If we're going to uphold the truth, we're going to try and live the truth, at some point, whether it be internal or external, we are going to have trouble and problems. The promise is not that we will be spared from those problems, but that we will overcome. And we will be improved in character by those problems. And so the, the other message is this. We should avoid leaving a difficult situation. Now, these people could have just packed up and left but rather try to overcome the problems that you have. So there's a couple of distinct exhortations that come out of this letter that Christ writes to Smyrna. He encourages them to continue in the course they had already taken and to be patient unto the end. So here is the persecuted ecclesia. It received Christ's commendation for works. Some texts do omit that, that, that word, but they definitely would have had works. He commends them for endurance of trials. They had material poverty due to giving priority to the truth, but they had a wealth, a richness of faith under trial. And they had stood against those who called themselves spiritual Jews, who are now members of the synagogue of Satan. And there is absolutely no condemnation or criticism by Christ of this little ecclesia. Wouldn't that be terrific if we, at the judgment seat, when we come before Christ as ecclesias, and we will come in contemporary groups, there's no question about that, when we come before Christ in contemporary groups, and you'll be able to identify the people who belong to one ecclesia over a period of time, wouldn't it be terrific if Christ actually said, just a brief comment, that ecclesia, whatever its name might have been, I've got no criticism of you. Wouldn't that be terrific? Well, there are very, very few ecclesias that will be in that position. 
But this is one of them, Smyrna. So what does he mean here by tribulation for ten days? You see there in verse 10, he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. So there's more trouble coming. Behold, the devil, the Roman authorities, shall cast some of you into prison, and ye shall be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Well, of course, we know on the day for a year principle, this is actually a reference to ten years. Ten years of intense persecution which occurred from AD 110 to 120 under Emperor Trajan, who was savage in his treatment of Christians. And one of the, one of the governors under Trajan wrote a letter along these lines. And Brother Thomas uh, has this in Eureka. Read the sounds of this letter. I am wearied with punishing and destroying the Galileans, or those of the sect called Christians, according to your orders. Yet they never cease to profess voluntarily what they are, and to offer themselves to death. Wherefore I have laboured by ex exhortation and threatening to discourage them from daring to confess to me that they are of that sect. Yet in defiance of all persecution, they still continue to do it. And this man was, he was exasperated. He had been butchering uh, Christians. Maybe not all of them had the truth, we don't know. But certainly there would have been some of our brethren who did have the truth involved in this. He'd been butchering Christians on the orders of Trajan for years. And he got to the point where he was sick to death of them. He says, be pleased therefore to inform me what your highness thinks proper to be done with them. So there was going to be a savage period of uh, persecution from AD 210 uh, to 220. In verse 11, Christ says this to the brethren at Smyrna. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the Ecclesias. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And the point he's making is this. If, you know, you know, you're not saying you should run out and put yourself in the arms of the persecutors. Uh, you're not saying that you should try and commit suicide in that way. What he's saying is that if they come after you and they find you, and in the course of events you are put to death, you, you might have your life terminated prematurely, but you will not suffer the second death. In other words, at the judgment seat, you are not going to be rejected and go off to my left hand and suffer the second death. So many would die the first death prematurely, but well, they were assured that they would not die the second death. That's why he begins this letter with those words, I am he that was dead, and now I live. It's a guarantee that they will join him one day in eternal life. So it was a short letter, wasn't it? because there's no criticism. But that's not the case with Pergamos. Pergamos is the opposite end of the scale, the Smyrna. And so we have, in verse 12, Christ now beginning his letter to the Ecclesia of Pergamos. So what does he do? Well, he says in verse 12, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now this also comes from the vision of the multitudinous Christ in chapter 1, because we see the, the multitudinous Christ, this, this man of the one in verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So here in Revelation 2.12, the sharp sword with two edges, drawn from chapter 1 verse 16, is clearly a reference to the spirit word. We know the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 4.12 talks about the Word of God being alive, like a sharp two-edged sword, cutting and dividing asunder that which is soulish and that which is spiritual. So why would Christ use this terminology to the Ecclesia at Pergamos? Well, he uses it because the issues here are doctrinal issues. Issues about interpreting the Bible. So there was doctrinal problems. He's talking about the sharp sword, which represents the Word of God. And he's saying, if you don't get it right, if you can't uphold the doctrines of that Word, then the day will come and I'll use that sharp sword against you, and I'll cut you off at the judgment seat of Christ. 
So that's his warning here to the Ecclesia at Pergamos. That's why he draws on that vision of chapter 1 that way. Pergamos means citadel or fortress, and if you go there you see exactly why it's called citadel or fortress. It's on the top of a hill, impregnable really, uh, for invading armies. It's an ancient royal city, the seat of the kingdom of Pergamon. It was bequeathed ultimately by Italus III, who had no heir and successor, to the Romans in BC 133. So when he died in that year, his empire, his kingdom, was bequeathed to the Romans in the West, who, of course, gladly accepted it. I'll go into the, into the prophetic uh, structure and history of that in a moment. It became the official capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was set proudly on a rocky hill in the broad plain of Caicos, some 25 kilometres or 15 miles from the sea. Its history and site spoke of permanence, of real strength, sure authority, and great size. Everything about Pergamos was like Texas. It was big. You know? It was always it's big. That was Pergamos in those times. And here is a model of the Pergamon Acropolis. So you can see this is an attempt to restore in a model form what was on the top of this mountain. And we've just been there walking all over that mountain and there's still a lot of ruins there. It's actually pretty well preserved for an ancient site. And um, you know, a lot of people go there to look at it because of its history. <coughs> but you can now go, this, this Pergamon altar here, which is no longer there, just the base of it, you can now go to the Berlin Museum and see that Pergamon altar. It's been... Um, taken away and, and rebuilt uh, in Berlin. The city acquired prominence when the Macedonian general Lysimachus chose its Acropolis as a stronghold for his treasure. He was a pretty wealthy man. He wanted to have some security because in those days it didn't have banks, like not that banks are secure by the way, but they didn't have banks. But they, he had something equivalent to Fort Knox. So Pergamon became like a Fort Knox for the treasure of Lysimachus. And Christ is going to make reference to that here in his letter. It was the first city in Asia to receive an Augustan temple dedicated to the worship of the emperor, which of course tells you something about how sensitive they were to their relationship to the Romans. It was the centre of Roman government and it imposed Roman authority and pagan religion on all its constituents. And that became a problem for the Ecclesia, as we're going to see. But let's just step back first of all. I think you're pretty familiar with the, the record of Daniel chapter 8. Because in Daniel chapter 8, we have the record of the Persian ram being overthrown by the Grecian goat. And the record tells us this. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, an he goat, so here's your he goat from Grecia and Macedonia came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. In other words, very, very speedy conquest. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now we know, of course, we don't have to argue about that because Daniel 8 interprets it for us. The notable horn was Alexander the Great, who had incredible victories in just 10 to 12 years. Well, the ram, of course, had two horns, we read in Daniel chapter 8. This ram, the Persian ram, uh, consisted of the Medes and Persians. And the Medes, of course, ruled for two years under Darius, and then the Persians for the last 204 years of the 206-year history of that empire. And then were finally overthrown by this Macedonian Grecian goat. And this is what Daniel is observing. And what happens is quite curious, isn't it? Because the notable horn of the goat, Alexander the Great, is broken. So here's your horn, broken. And eventually, after his death, some 20 years after his death, his empire was broken up by his four generals, two of whom became very prominent. Seleucus formed the Seleucid Kingdom, King of the North, and Ptolemy formed the Southern Kingdom in Egypt, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, the King of the South. And so we have four kingdoms emerging in the place of Alexander the Great, breaking up his empire into four parts. But out of one of those grew a little horn. It's called the little horn of the goat. Now this little horn, of course, is the emergence 
of the Roman Empire in the East. How did that happen? Well, you see, it happened because the kingdom of Pergamum, which was one of these four horns, when Attalus III died, was bequeathed to the Romans. So the Romans grabbed hold of that territory and so emerged the Roman Empire in the East. Last for another thousand years. So this is the little horn that emerges from the Pergamum Empire, which we, we saw uh, when we reviewed the history of Pergamos. That happened in 133 BC. So this was all, of course, predicted uh, in the Word of God. So here's the Pergamon altar. Eumenes II, about BC 160, continued the, the pro-Roman policy of his father and brought most of Asia Minor under his control and, and forced them, basically, to, to bow to Rome. He built the altar of Zeus, and this is the altar which is now in the, in the museum in Ber Berlin, and developed the library. And in fact, the, library, the foundations of the library are still there. Uh, which was, uh, it rivaled Alexandria in its time, that library. It was founded by his father, and uh, as I said, it rivaled the school in the library of Alexandria in Egypt. So, this place was very, very powerful, prominent, and prosperous. But this is Pergamos today. It has no treasure, no altar, no throne, no library, no name and no ecclesia. So things have changed. The ecclesia is long since gone. Why? Well, you can go there to this place where men celebrated their strength and their prowess and their education. All right? There's no one there today. Nobody sits in those chairs today to, to wallow in the pride of men. So Christ writes this letter to the ecclesia of Pergamos. He's going to highlight certain issues. One of them is this down here in verses 14 and 15. But let's just lead ourselves into it by reading verse 13, where he says, I know thy works, again, some omit that, that from the text, and where thou dwellest, even where <coughs> Satan's seat is. Now, Satan's seat, of course, is a reference to the fact that this became the centre of the Roman Empire in Asia. And by AD 96, it was a very prominent centre of Roman authority in Asia. So that's why it's called Satan's seat. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. So they had some good points. Even in those days wherein Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelt. Now, we're going to have a look at who this Antipas uh, is. And we're going to see what happened to that class of people in the Ecclesia. But we go on to verse 15 and 16 and we find that Christ has got some problems with them. So as now them also that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So they've got a Balaam problem, they've got a Nicolaitan problem. Right? You've got verse 14, those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stunting block before the children of Israel. They've got problems. So what's a summary, you think, of this letter and its content? Well, we've tried to do that here on the right-hand side. It is insufficient to be faithful personally, even under persecution. We must withstand error strenuously. It is possible to be so loving and embracing that we tolerate false doctrine and place our ecclesia in peril. And that's what happened here in Pergamos. So how? How did it happen? So here's your summary. Pergamos is the embattled ecclesia. It's under pressure. It receives Christ's commendation for works, holding fast to Christ in the seat of Roman power in Asia, not denying the faith under trial, but it is criticised for tolerating adherence to the doctrine of Baal, and tolerating adherence to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So who were these people? Well, they were the people who differed from the Antipas class in the Ecclesia. Now this Antipas of verse 13 is not one individual. The name Antipas means like the Father, but it's a reference to a class of people who had suffered persecution and had withstood it. 
And that word martyr suggests that because martyr or martyrs means to witness sometimes by death. And that's the way it's used in Revelation 17 and verse 6, the last occurrence of the word in the New Testament. And Brother Thomas says this, the name Antipas, he says, is typical of a class at that time and signifies against all Nicolaitans, Balaamites, children of Jezebel, false apostles, and spurious Jews. Now, of course, he's, he's gathered together in, in, in a basket there all of the apostates who appear in these seven letters, who, as Justin says, are called Christians, but are atheists and impious heretics, because that in all things they teach what is blasphemous, ungodly, and unsound. So he's, he's uh, definitely identified uh, who the errorists are, and of course the Antipas class are those who stood against them. And one of those classes that they had to stand against was a group of brethren in Pergamos who had decided that the best way forward under persecution was to compromise a little and to use what Christ calls the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, his name means the waster of the people, not unlike Nicolaitans. We are told of him in Jude verse 11 that he ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, at least the class in the Ecclesia of Jude's time were like Balaam. They ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Now, of course, we know what motivated Balaam. Self-interest. That's what motivated that man. He knew a bit about the truth. He knew what his obligations were, but he was motivated by self-interest. And there was a doctrine that surrounded this man. Balaam took a compromise with the world's religions. And some in Pergamos were doing the same thing. You know how Balaam encouraged, uh, he, he encouraged uh, Balak, the king of Moab, to set up altars. And then finally he counseled Balak to send in the women with their sacrifices. And that's what happened. Of course, we know about Baal Peor and the disaster that overtook Israel with 24,000 people perished. So Balaam taught the doctrine of expediency, and so did these brethren. What they were saying was this. You see, the practice was in Pergamos, because it was the centre of Roman authority, and, and Caesar was worshipped as a god, they used to have these little altars of incense along the streets. So when you went to go to work or shopping or wherever it might be, you came out of your house in the morning, you would put a pinch of incense on the altar. There would be some kind of fire burning. You'd put a pinch of incense on the altar and people look and say, oh, well, he's a faithful, or he or she's a faithful Roman. They'd put their pinch of incense. But if you didn't, that would be reported to the authorities. And they would be turning up at your door saying, why didn't you put your pinch of incense on the altar of incense in the street? Why not? Well, of course, you explain, well, I'm a Christadelphian, I don't, you know, we're not going to acknowledge, see, he's not a god. But you see, this was a debate in the Ecclesia. Some were saying, well, I'm just not going to do it. They were the Antipas class. Others were saying, well, what does it hurt? What does it hurt to put a little pinch of incense on this altar to Caesar? He's not a god. Paul wrote, Paul said there are gods many and lords many, and it's all rubbish. So we, you know, why don't we just go out and put the incense on because he doesn't exist as a god. That was their policy. Now that doesn't sound like bad, does it really? It sounds like you can sort of make peace with the world. And see, some people were caught up by this doctrine of expediency, but Christ wasn't very happy with it. He said he disliked it immensely. And so, we have this doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of expediency, being taught by some uh, uh, in this ecclesia of Pergamos, and it was undermining the faith. But what about the Nicolaitans? Nicolaitans is formed of two words, Nikos, victory, and Laetus, people. The vanquishers, or the, the conquerors uh, of the people. Those who have a victory ultimately over the people. And they do it, of course, by undermining the faith. Now these were a class of errorists who introduced Gentile philosophy. Paul calls it, in 1 Timothy 6.20, the oppositions of science, falsely so called. He also says in 2 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 15, he makes reference to this, 
Their word eats as a gangrene or as a canker. In 1 Corinthians 15 he says, there are those who teach the resurrection is past already. Alright, so here are people who were teaching wrong doctrine. And they based their teachings on the science of the day. I don't need to tell you that in parts of our brotherhood today we are troubled by those who are leaning towards theistic evolution. Alright, there there's a group of brethren and sisters who have written to the Christadelphian magazine asking to have their views published and their view is that we should tell the world that we acknowledge that evolution is correct and try and reconcile the Bible with it. Yeah, it's happening. So the very, very same thing is occurring in our brotherhood today that was occurring in Pergamos. We have Nicolaitans at work and they are conquering some of our people. More and more are joining this bandwagon. It's happening in Australia, even more than it's happening over here on this continent. And if I was to mention some of the names, if you knew these people, you would marvel. It's happening to people that I never would have suspected it could happen. So you see, we've got to be on our guard because these things will destroy the foundations of the faith. So the the doctrine of expediency. You give a little to the world so that they'll just back off, okay? It doesn't work in the long run. And the, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which undermines the faith by the stupidities of modern science, that is at work today. What about the people who resisted? The anti pass class, the faithful class. Well, Christ is going to make them a promise. So we come down in verse 16. He calls upon those imbued with the ideas of Balaam and the Nicolaitans to repent. Repent, he says, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Because these are doctrinal issues. In verse 17, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manner, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he, that receiveth it. Two marvellous things are referred to there. So what's this hidden map? Well, bear in mind that the Macedonian Lysimachus hid his treasure here. This was his Fort Knox. Well, of course, he died in battle somewhere and someone of his, one of his relatives took it over and wasted it all. So that's what happens, isn't it? It was gone. So, he hid his treasure here because of the security of this place. So Christ is writing to the Ecclesia at a time when there's great treasure in this city. And he offers them his hid treasure. Now, Lysimachus' treasure was hidden too. Now he calls his hid treasure the hidden manor in verse 17. Now we know that there were three types of manor. There was the manor that lasted for a day, there was a the manor that lasted for two days, over the Sabbath. And there was a manner that never corrupted. All of them spoke, of course, of aspects of the work of Christ, didn't they? And of course, this manner that never corrupted spoke of his immortality and the immortality offered to those who were in him. So this manner was taken and put in the ark. Now, the ark wasn't made when the manner first appeared in Exodus 16, but eventually, the little golden pot of this manner that never corrupted was placed in the ark of the covenant. And it was put there as evidence to Israel, if they have the eye of faith to, to know that it was there, that eternal life was being offered. You can be part of this ark, this, this mercy seat Christ, joined by the same piece of gold to the cherubim, with the Shekinah, the dwelling presence of Yahweh between those cherubim. You can be part of the glory of which that speaks in the kingdom age. But you have to have your sight set, your faith sight set, not on things like Lysimachus' treasure that the world offers, but on something you can't see, that hidden pot of manna, hidden away in that ark. When you set your sights on that, one day you'll be permitted, as it were, to eat of it. It did not corrupt, hence it spoke of the immortality to be grown in the future to those who constitute the cherubim of Yahweh. And so we read of the redeemed 
Christ has with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And he's going to talk about that because he's going to give them a stone in which there's a name written. And it's his father's name. Now in those times they used to use a white stone and a black stone in trials. Paul tells us this, that when he stood before Agrippa, you remember? This is what he said in Acts 26 verse 10. And when they, that is the believers, were being executed, like, of course, Stephen was at his feet, I cast my pebble, my stone, against them. What they used to do was that when you sat in some, something like the Sanhedrin or some kind of court, you would have a white stone and a black stone. And when it came time to vote, on the sentence to be passed on whoever it was that was standing before this court, you would put out the white stone if you wanted to acquit them. White, righteousness, acquittal, all right, freedom. But if you wanted to condemn them to death, you put out the black stone. And the black stone meant that they went off to be killed. So white was life, black was death. And Christ says here, I'll give him, the man who overcomes, the man who repents, turns around, overcomes, I'll give him a white stone. And in the stone, there'll be a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Of course, that name is the name of Yahweh our God. The name that means he who will become. And when the hidden manna is revealed at the judgment seat, immortality is given to the faithful, a white stone, as it were, is handed to them. And it has the Father's name. And their Father's name, of course, we, are, we read in Revelation 14, verse 1, is inscribed upon their forehead. Not literally inscribed upon their forehead. It's actually telling the simple message that the Father's character has been part of the way that they think and operate. It's inscribed upon their forehead, which speaks of their intelligence. So that is the message left for, the, for those who are faithful in Pergamos. In our next session, God willing, we're going to have a look at the Ecclesia at Thyatira, just one Ecclesia, and we're going to see that it presents the challenge of remaining steadfast to the end.